I'm Josh. I work for a little startup called Uber. Um, and uh, I work in and around the Knowledge Graph team at Uber. Um, and that's obviously what I want to tell you about here. I chose a little bit of a different format for this talk uh, than most of the talks yesterday. I guess the, the most similar one would have been um, uh, Juan's talk towards the end of the day. Um, but I really tried to imagine um, if I had um, attended a conference like this two years ago before I joined um, Uber, um, what kind of 20 minute talk would uh, have been uh, uh, the most useful to me? And it actually wouldn't have been so much a technical talk um, because I have a semantic web background, I'm a co-founder of Tinkerpop, I like to think um, that I know a few things about um, ontologies, about graph query languages and so on. Um, but there are also a lot of um, uh, organizational and social challenges to building um, an enterprise knowledge graph at a large company uh, that I'd like to talk about. Because uh, by talking about that, th these things, I think you can save some time. So um, just to be clear, I came to Uber for the data. Um, I am very you know, sold on the idea of the gig economy. Um, I was very excited about things like self-driving cars, flying taxis, and other things that uh, are coming down the pipe at Uber. Um, but uh, what was really exciting to me was this vast expanse of, um, of, of data. Um, so we have about 200,000 managed data sets at Uber. Last year, we passed the 10 billion trip uh, mark which kind of sounds like a lot, but in comparison with some of the numbers you heard yesterday, it's not too big. Um, so it's definitely manageable. Uh, it gives you an idea of how big our graph is. Um, we have a lot more sensor data, um, you know, orders of magnitude more. Um, and there's a lot of untapped potential there for uh, graph stream processing. Um, so if we're all here next year, hopefully I can, I can tell you a little bit about um, how we're approaching graph stream processing. Um, in the meantime, there are a lot of pressing um, use cases for strong semantics um, and for some sort of inference um, uh, on data at Uber. Um, but I like to uh, make the analogy between building an enterprise knowledge graph, um, EKG, and um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, that, like, you know, at the bottom you have physiological needs like um, food and water and fresh air and not getting eaten by wolves and things. At the top you have uh, self-actualization. Um, the point is it's hard to self-actualize and run from the wolves at the same time. And similarly, in, with knowledge graphs, you have different layers that depend on each other. So I'm sure at the back of the room you can't read all this text, but I've got different layers here. Infrastructure, data, graph, knowledge, logic. Um, and the point is just that there are, um, there are dependencies of the, the higher layers on the lower layers. Um, and honestly, we're kind of in the middle there right now with our knowledge graph. Um, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of ontologies, uh, you know, a little bit of inference creeping in, but um, for the first year or so is mostly just about getting all the data together, um, getting it integrated, um, uh, doing all these things in such a way that we can, uh, we can e ETL data in and uh, query data out, do queries, shortest paths, subgraph queries, uh, fairly basic stuff, but do it at scale. Um, but now these, these higher layers are, are getting more important. So most of my slides are going to be like this. Um, you tell me if this, is, this glass is half empty or half full. I'll start by talking about some half empty type things. This is an easy one. Um, a lot of the speakers yesterday um, brought this up that uh, you know working with messy data is hard, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but the fact is, if you want to build an enterprise knowledge graph at a company like Uber, you do have to deal with messy data because many of the data sets um, are not as clean as we would like them to be, particularly the data sets that come from uh, manual user input, you know, drivers entering information on their phones um, and so on. So either you uh, just divorce yourself entirely of messy data and say, we're not going to deal with that, come back when you have better data for the graph, or um, uh, you have to deal with the messiness. Um, another point here, we are not all ontologists, so we don't all have semantic web PhDs. 
Um, not everyone knows what the semantic web is. Not everyone cares what the semantic web is. In fact, very few people care what the semantic web is, um, which is not to say that semantic web is uh, not relevant. You know, Juan made the point yesterday, knowledge graphs are just um, uh, a lot of other things by, by a new name. Um, but uh, yeah, the point is we have thousands of schemas at Uber, RPC schemas, um, streaming, uh, storage schemas, um, and if you want to make a knowledge graph out of all that, you need to deal with um, this, this less than, you know, it's not a bunch of owl ontologies. Um, so life gives you lemons, you know, like thousands of thrift schemas, you need to make lemonade. Um, so good enough does not scale. Uh, the point I'm making here is that um, uh, it's very easy in, in building something where you have immediate business needs, which we do. Uh, most of our use cases have to do with risk and safety right now um, to make short-term solutions that uh, uh, that get you know, sort of turn into a ball of complexity later on as additional business needs are added. Um, and I'm uh, criticizing myself here because I did this when I first joined. Um, there was already a knowledge graph. They were using a bunch of really atrocious gremlin queries for uh, things like shortest pass, and the reason they were so bad is because uh, there were also a lot of um, requirements around concurrency, uh, and Gremlin, just vanilla Gremlin wasn't really a good uh, uh, fit for those queries. Um, so I said, okay, let's just build this again from scratch. Let's do, you know, a, you know, um, a two-way breadth for a search, and then we can do all the things we need with concurrency. Uh, the problem was, as additional requirements piled up, additional constraints needed to be added to the language that we used for expressing paths, and it wasn't really built for that. So a better long-term solution might have been to use uh, perhaps Cypher or Sparkle, um, and then write a, um, an implementation that did all the things we need in terms of concurrency. Um, obviously, that would have been more work up front, but would have saved work uh, longer term. So beware of the hype cycle. Again, knowledge graphs are a lot of other things by a new name. Um, often knowledge graph uh, projects start up at companies because someone in management kind of got the bug, um, hires a bunch of people, um, which is great, um, but they also bring in a lot of preconceived notions about what a knowledge graph is. So you have to be kind of flexible um, in, uh, in choosing what you put it, the technologies that you put into your knowledge graph. Um, so this one is kind of painful. No one really likes RDF among the uh, develop, developer community, even if it's the right tool for the job. So if you're going to use RDF, you at least need to marshal some really good arguments for why you're using RDF, or kind of do it discreetly, which is what I've tended to do. Um, so. Um, at the same time, property graphs are not enough. You know, again, this is a tinker popper saying this. Um, there's, there's a lot of excitement about property graphs as the new shiny thing for, for knowledge graphs in certain, uh, in certain places. Um, but it was actually quite difficult to map all of our data into the property graph, sort of a vanilla property graph data model. Um, so we ended up extending the data model, and I'll tell you more about that. So some glass half full type um, items here. Um, again, I have a semantic web background. Obviously, I'm going to tell you you should use standards, uh, but it's not just for making the world a better place. It's also for saving time and money. Um, you should really think hard about inventing a new query language or inventing a new data model, unless you have really good reasons to do it, and you're willing to push that data model or that query language all the way through to a standard. Um, which is what we're doing with our data model. Um, otherwise, you're creating what we like to call tech debt. Um, it's going to make your tools much less maintainable in the long term. Um, so this is a very important one to me. Um, I see it as really fundamental to building an enterprise knowledge graph to first establish um, some kind of a system for shared vocabularies. Um, and we have those now. They sit below the graph in that, that hierarchy I showed you. Um, but at Uber now, we have um, a standard set of schemas 
that are recommended for everyone to use across RPC, storage, um, and of course in the graph as well. Um, and that's a big one for the graph. So we're pretty good at doing this at Uber. Um, also, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Xiaoya from uh, Airbnb got a question related to this. You know, why did you build your own tooling? Why didn't you um, uh, buy or use off-the-shelf open source tooling? And his answer, as with our answer, is that there's a lot of, in a company the size of Uber, there's a lot of existing infrastructure to make use of. There are dedicated teams for building out that infrastructure, maintaining it, dealing with, with um, issues that crop up. So if you can make use of that, um, you really should. Um, also a very important one to me, fit the data model to the data. As I said, property graphs were kind of a, 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 a reasonable first pass at a data model for us, but most of our data is not in the shape of uh, you know, a property graph. It's, it's very different. It's a record style syntaxes like uh, Google protocol buffers, Apache Thrift, Apache Avro, relational schemas. Um, so really, we really needed something that was more of a direct mapping of those formats, which represent the majority of our data into um, a knowledge graph data model. So again, I said we should, you should do standards when you, when you can, but sometimes there are good reasons to depart from the standards. Um, and we'll be pushing to make that into a standard. Um, so again, budget for other stuff. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of things that are lower in the uh, hierarchy. If you have services, you have to babysit the services. Um, you have to deal with uh, alerts uh, and notifications. Um, you have to do migrations. You have to do uh, data cleaning and so on. Um, so if you want to isolate your yourself from those things, um, then, uh, you know, by all means do it, but uh, you can't always. So, collaborate early and often. The first uh, year of the Knowledge Graph at Uber, we didn't do very much of this. It was kind of heads down coding and, and getting all these things together to get them to work. Um, this past year, we've been a, a bit more open, you know, presenting at conferences like this, um, inviting speakers, you know, a, a couple people in the room here, maybe three people in the room were invited speakers, Juan and Jans and, and, and Craig. Um, but uh, a lot of those collaborations have been really fruitful in terms of uh, stimulating ideas and uh, uh, giving things that, uh, giving us things we, we, can, we can work on together with the community. It's been really healthy for the graph. So that's my last uh, bullet. This one, I had some bullet bullets here for you, uh, but our communications team asked me to take them out. Um, there's good reasons for that. Um, the reasons are that, again, a lot of our use cases are in risk and safety, and there is such a thing as bad actors who are not stupid. Um, so, but I can give you a verbal description. So there are three main components of our knowledge graph. There's the OLTP graph, or the real-time graph. Uh, that's based on an in-house uh, Cassandra-based graph database uh, with uh, SLAs in milliseconds. Then we have the OLAP graph, or the analytics, um, and that's based on HDFS, and we use CAPS, or Cypher, for Apache Spark. Um, those jobs are submitted manually by our data scientists, um, and they have SLAs in hours. And then we have our graph embeddings. Um, so don't ask me too many hard questions about graph embeddings, that's not my area, uh, but we're using a technique called graph sage. Um, and we, uh, um, we take graphs from our, what we call our glacial graph, and generate features, which we then uh, submit to our ML um, systems, and they're used for things like recommendations. Um, so something I can say a lot more about is, again, um, our data models. Um, we have standard vocabularies, just beginning with basic things like type aliases for URLs, UIDs, um, timestamps you'd be surprised how many hundreds of times, you know, the concept of a timestamp is reinvented. Uh, so we bring all those things together. Um, we also have structured types for, you know, geospatial data, financial data, sensor data, um, you know, user contact info, um, uh, many things. 
Um, and then we have our entities and relationships, which of course are important for the graph. And we have um, best practices for modeling entities and relationships. Um, and then finally, we have tooling that carries data and schemas between all these different formats that we use in, um, in different places within Uber. Um, if you want to know more about that, uh, just talk to me, or I gave a talk um, last January at Graph Day that uh, delved into those details. So finally, um, we have our metadata graph. This is a relatively new thing, but I mentioned we have hundreds of thousands of data sets. Uh, they all have metadata associated with them. Um, they've been all manually annotated with uh, metadata, which is a huge task. Um, they're relatively simple annotations right now. But we have a lot of really pressing um, needs for good annotations. Um, for one thing, um, we have data, um, we have policies around user data protection um, stemming from GDPR and our own in, uh, internal policies. Um, but it turns out it's fairly hard to define what constitutes uh, user data. Sometimes, you know, user data has a transitive relationship with the user, you know, some, some kind of compound relationship where you need to do just a little bit of inference. Um, on the schema to tell whether um, it is in fact user uh, private data that needs to be protected in a certain way, in a certain context. Um, so the schemas from the last slide are hugely important here, having strong schemas. So that's our form of annotation now, um, is annotating, we annotate um, our data sets with um, uh, basically entity types from our ontology, and then we can do various things with that, including building, uh, you know, this uber-wide uh, knowledge graph is, is kind of the next step. So I saved the, the most fun thing for last, um, our data model. I'm calling it algebraic property graphs for now. Um, it was developed at Uber, but it's going to be used in Tinkerpop. We're working out, you know, how it fits in, um, you know, what, what we should call it, and so on. Uh, we're all, also working with the um, Property Graph Schema Working Group, uh, which is uh, uh, led by Juan, um, on aligning the two data models. So um, Jan Hitters of that group has written a nice specification um, for APG based on set theory. We have another that's based on category theory, and we're kind of aligning the two. Um, so we should be able to, to publish something on that pretty soon. Um, otherwise, again, just uh, come and talk to me. I'd be happy to talk for hours about data modeling. Um, and I think we have time for questions. Yep, we do have time for questions. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Hello. Um, so if you have um, a background in the semantic web area, you, you know the concept of URI, unique identifiers. So how do you promote the usage of URI across, um, for example, all the systems, non-graph non, non system inside the, inside the company, so they can align with the, with the URI in the, in the knowledge graph? So how do you, do you expose your unique identifiers, and how do you deal with that? Good question, but luckily um, we, we're not actually exposing any data at this time. We would like to do that. We would like to start exposing certain uh, data sets as public data sets. And at that point, we will have to think about mapping our internal identifiers to URIs. Um, I don't expect that, that that would be a very hard problem. But in terms of our internal identifiers, we use EUIDs. And that's, that's been kind of the, the best practice at Uber for a long time. So we don't actually need URIs internally, we use UIDs. We can have one more question. Okay. Would you say it's better to build the infrastructure first and then start gathering the data, or is there a benefit in this case of having had lots of data, real world messy data, and then figuring out the, the best infrastructure for it? I'd say it's definitely good to have the data first. 
um, is that, that gives you requirements um, that you can use to design uh, your in-house solutions. But I think it's, in some cases, it's also a good idea to start out with, uh, with open source tools. For example, in the Knowledge Graph, before I'd even joined, uh, we were using uh, Janus Graph, we're using Gremlin, um, and a few other things. And if nothing else, those, um, uh, kind of the experience of using those open source tools informed the requirements that we then used to build um, systems that were better tailored to, uh, to our needs.